Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. The Word of God is ever present. It doesn't change. It doesn't become something different. One of the things we need to do is make sure we never let the things in the Word of God slip. And just as we cover it once again and again, different um, biblical truths. Um, it's never wrong to cover them more than once or hundreds of times because they, they stay true, okay? Um, we do live in a world that opposes truth consistently and constantly, battling for your mind every day, restating sinful things or, uh, or anti-God things in another way to, to, to thwart your ability to receive the Word and to walk in the Word. So, um, because of the way the, the uh, information meeting works today, your mind is the intellectual playground of the devil if you don't keep it full of the word. All right? So, let's talk about this. Number one, F.F. F. Bosworth in his book, Christ the Healer, makes this statement. Appropriating faith cannot go beyond one's knowledge of the revealed will of God. Now, we put that simply, faith begins where the will of God's known. To anyone who desires to receive any blessing from God, including healing, it is imperative that the word on the matter be understood. Solomon states it this way in Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son, if you've got prayer calls, we can go ahead and bring them up. Uh, my son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life to those that find them and health to all their flesh. Bosworth continues in this book by saying, Until we know what God's will is, there is nothing to base our faith upon. So then, Bible faith is an action based upon a belief that is based upon the revealed knowledge of God's Word. In other words, your faith, your believing comes from what God's Word says. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Anything else is simply futile. When God's will is known and acted upon, then, and only then, is faith released and can there be faith, and there can be faith results. Romans 12.2 tells us to renew our minds, uh, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This mind renewal breaks, as I've said before in teachings uh, past, world conformity, world thinking, and most importantly, world limitations. Okay? We serve a limitless God with limitless power. It is our duty to feed upon the Word of God and hear it taught and preached, for in so doing we position ourselves to be men and women of faith. And why is that so? Because Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God, these are all my notes I've written, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I cover them because I want to make sure I get this out, all right? So I'm, I'm forcing myself to sit and read it, not get away from it. God has revealed his, has given his, I'm sorry, God has given his word to us to reveal his will to us. So in other words, if you don't want, if you want to know what God's will is, how many times, how many times have we prayed? Lord, you know, I will do the such and such if it be thy will. Well, first of all, go find out if it's already stated in here. Because if it's already in here, then we know what his will on the matter is. He's already given you a commentary on it. Now, there is not a, a, a scripture that says that, Lord, thou shalt go to uh, Nim, Nim, uh, Namibia, Namibia, and preach the gospel there. What does Lloyd do? Lloyd has to pray and find out if the Lord wants him to go to Namibia. It used to be called South, Southwest Africa. Okay? Now they, they, uh, they changed the name about 20 years ago to Namibia, or back to Namibia. All right? You find out, first of all, you go to the Word to see if it's already in the Word. You don't go to God and ask him what his will is, and then go to the Word as his last result to find out if it's in there. You go first to the Word. When the word is revealed to, uh, I'm sorry, I, mean, I skipped over a couple of scriptures here. I skipped over a bunch of scriptures. Um, John 16, 13, Jesus said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But wh whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And then in 1 John 20, 27, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things, then verse 27, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, 
and you need not any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it is taught you, you shall abide in him. Now let me just make it real clear. When it says here you have no man teach you, it's not talking about teachers in the church or preachers in the church. It's talking about people teaching out of their philosophy or opinion and not the word of God, not that the anointing. You don't need what somebody's, somebody's personal opinion is on it. You need what the anointing says through them. God put teachers in the church, so he can't be meaning not have his own teachers that he put in the church to teach you. It can't mean that. Or, or, or God be schizophrenic. So it's talking about men teaching you out of their own wisdom or their own counsel. How do you know? He says the anointing which you receive abideth in you. It's the anointing. It's the anointed preaching and teaching through the ministry gifts we do receive. You just, so that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about not receiving from ministers of the gospel. Now people run off that and go have house church and nobody teaches. We don't need pastors and all because no man needs to teach us. Well, you know, get your head out of the sand and stop being stupid and go to the Bible and, and, and use some, you know, use some Holy Ghost uh, additives to your Bible study and let him teach you some things about you, you not being stupid. Okay? All right. When the word is revealed to us, faith accompanies it. So uh, what, uh, when they, uh, when you receive it, then you can and must act on the word. Now, let's get in here. Here's what we're after. So we just kind of laid the real quick foundation in, in record time. That the word of God is the basis of what we believe. The word of God is where we get our information from. The word of God is what we go to to establish the will of God. We do not go to Aunt Louise because she didn't get healed. All right? Why? Because she bases hers on experience. And the Bible doesn't say a thing about faith cometh by experience and experience through what Aunt Louise went through. We don't get it from somebody's experience or even our own experience. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith is imparted into us out of God's Word. In order to establish or lay a good foundation to the subject, we must go to the beginning of things in order to establish God's original purpose for man. Okay? Um, we understand God's will for man will, is birthed out of his purpose. One has to be a careful student of the first three chapters of Genesis. In the first chapter, we see the hand of the creator carefully laying the groundwork for a special creation, man. After each endeavor, the God, word of God says that God saw that it was good. Remember, God did this, and he saw that it was good. He did this, he saw that it was good. Yet, after he created man, it says he saw that it was very good. Only time it's said. When he created man, it was very good. God created things good. Um, man, he created very good. And why did he create things good? He created good things for his very good creation, man. All right? There's no sign of sickness, pain, defeat in mankind until after the fall. Then and only then, because of the treason of man, did the wrath of Satan begin to take its toil in the wonderful creation of God. Satan began to pervert everything God created. Now, um, the very first thing he perverted was righteousness or eternal life or actually uh, man being alive unto God. We, we use terms sometimes because we get post-original uh, creation. Man was not really even created righteous. He wasn't created, um, you know, to, to get everlasting life. He was created out of the very essence of God, the very God's very spirit. He had the same kind of life that God had. God created man initially with Zoe life, just life like he had it. Just, there he was. God took part of himself, put it in that body, and it became, a, as, as the Hebrew says, a speaking spirit. So man was not created to live or to, he wasn't created mortal or immortal, he was created eternal. Okay? Now he did have a beginning, but he, you know, he was not to have an end. He wasn't to die. It was only after the fall that that happened. And so Satan initially perverted na man's nature from that of the nature of God to the nature of himself. Adam was, as one person said, the first man to ever be born again. He was born from life unto death. Now, Jesus is the first one to be born from death unto life. Okay? And that's another subject in another day. All right? So righteousness becomes a sinful nature. Prosperity became poverty. Life became death. Health became sickness. It was not so in the beginning. In order, uh, it became so after the fall. This is, uh, we say this because in order to show God's purpose of man's original creation, God did not create man sick. 
He wasn't even susceptible to disease. Disease is a perversion of health. We know viruses get out there and they go, they get into the cells and they pervert them and make them, you know, not normal. Uh, cancer is a perversion of healthy cells. Okay, they, they, the scientists keep studying. If they can figure out how to turn that cancer off so that it starts perverting cells to unhealthy, they could cure it. And that's what they're. That's one. That's one of the main ways they try to figure out is try to figure out how to turn that unhealthy uh, adaptation in the cells off, going to, from healthy to thought perverted from with a healthy state and, and with the cancer working in them they're trying to figure out how to make that stop and how to turn it back if they can do that they can figure out get into that and figure out how to do that they can cure it and that's what they keep working on well it's, see it's in the world because of sin okay God's purpose is his will that's further carried out in his, con his covenant now remember we've talked about this recently uh, the King James Bible and some other Bibles do the same thing. When you look in your Bible and you're reading, in, particularly in the Old Testament, and you see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, but in what they call, refer to as small caps. In other words, they're not all the normal size capital letters in there. They're, they're small caps. And they do that to make a, dis, a, a distinguishing um, mark in the scriptures to let you know that that was a translation of the Hebrew letters Y-H-W-H. Now, those are transliterations from the Hebrew symbols. I, they, you know, that's their lettering system. It's different than ours, but use it to what we call the Aramaic, uh, Aramaic lettering, which is what we use. They use, um, they take the symbols, and, come, and so they come at Y-H-W-H, four consonants. They refer to it as the unpronounceable name of God. Scholars believe that it was pronounceable at one time. They just wouldn't do it so for so long they forgot. It. Nobody knows how it was pronounced because they went so long with it thinking it was too holy to say or too pronounce. When they would write it, they would get up. Every time they wrote the word Y-H-W-H, they got up and went and cleansed themselves because the name of God was so holy. Okay? And so they wouldn't pronounce it because it was too holy to come out of their lips, they thought. And so after, after a certain, you do that long enough and nobody's going to know how to say it. Now, the, you know, uh, you, we all know that North Carolina is uh, part of the home for the Cherokee, original Cherokee nation. North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, parts of Alabama, th that region was, was the home of the Cherokee Nation. Now, they, they were there, the Cherokee language they currently have now is the third Cherokee language. They've studied that historically and found out. There's two that have died. And they were about to lose this one. It was dying out because nobody spoke it. We were up there, Nathan and I were there a couple of years ago. We were camping over at the Cherokee uh, KOA. And uh, the guy that was driving us up the river to go tubing was Cherokee. And um, he, he said he spoke Indian. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying, oh, you're a racist. He said he spoke Indian. Not me, all right? And um, he was telling us, you know, there's only like 600 to 800 full-blood Cherokee on the reservation that are still there. They're dying off. But the Cherokee reservation about 15 years ago or 20 years ago made a decision that they had to teach their children their language or it would be dead within another generation. So now all the street signs in Cherokee are in Cherokee and in English. The school is in Cherokee. They go to school, and they're like a Cherokee immersion school. They speak Cherokee. Why? Because their language was dying. And so they're making sure that these next generation. So those kids from kindergarten through high school learn the language. So they're fluent in Cherokee when they graduate from high school. Or well before then, anyway. They're fluent in Cherokee. Okay? Why? To save the language. They knew, see, if they hadn't done this a, little, a few years ago, by the time the next generation got here, that language had been lost too. Nobody would know how to pronounce a thing. All right? Well, we have here, the same thing was happening, the same thing that happened with that name, Y-H-W-H. After enough time of not pronouncing it, nobody could remember how to say it. We came along uh, sometime later, uh, particularly when the German, German translators began, began translating Bible and stuff, and, of course, in German, there's a J instead of a Y. So, okay, J-H-W-H. Okay, really, V-H. You know, because they, trans, they transcribe their V's and W's opposite of what we do. Pronounce them different, too, you know. And um, put vowels in there. So, they took the J, added an E. Then took the H, added an O. Took the other, uh, the V, added an A. And then uh, add H, Jehovah. Now, we got cute and came up, well, that was right, because it's, it's Y-H-W-H. And so they put uh, Y-A-W-A-H, Yahweh. So those two words come from the exact same 
four letters in the, in, in the historical language. You've heard people say his name's Yahweh, we call him Jehovah. They come from the same place. They are, they are attempts to pronounce that compound of letters that, that are unpronounceable without adding vowels to it, okay? So, it is his name. We, you know, we, if you say his name, he is Jehovah, we can't, we can't say he is Y-H-W-H. Every time we want to say it. So we, we made it so it's pronounceable to us. I said that because it is the distinctive covenant name of God. Uh, here's what Dr. Schofield says in his, in his study Bible. Jehovah is distinctly um, the redemptive name of deity. It means the self-existent one who reveals himself. The self-existent one who reveals himself. Isn't that wonderful? Not only does he, he exist, but he's going to reveal himself to us. There are seven redemptive, and then Schofield goes on and talks about that the seven redemptive names point to a continuous and increasing self-revelation. In his redemptive relation to man, Jehovah has seven compound names. I'm sorry. In, in redemptive relation to man, Jehovah has seven compound names which reveal him as meeting every need of man for his lost state to the end. And this is Dr. Schofield. You know, the Southern Baptists, the Baptists love Dr. Schofield. Hey, if you're a Baptist and you don't have a Schofield Bible, you're a heretic. I mean, they, they have Schofield Bibles. That's their study Bible. Like, like a lot of charismatics have a Copeland or a Hagen Bible, they got a Schofield. And, um, but, you know, so, so what? Jehovah is distinctly the redemptive name of God, the self-existent one who reveals himself. The names point to a continuous and increasing self-revelation. In other words, every time a compound covenant name is used, it is an increasing of the revelation of who God is. In other words, Jehovah is the covenant God. He is the redemptive God of the covenant. When the compound names are added, it adds another aspect to who he is. Okay, in other words, he reveals more of himself. So let's look at the, um, I'm, I'm not going to go to the references, but let's look at Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there or present. You know, the Lord is present. He's here. Jehovah Shalom. Oh, that's easy. The Lord is, is our peace. Jehovah Ra, the Lord is our shepherd. Now, I probably didn't pronounce that right, but it's R-A hyphen A-H. Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, my provider's grace is sufficient. For, all right. Jehovah Jireh, he's our, you know, I remember that song. And yeah, we need to sing some of that. Anyway, uh, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. Or the Lord is our victor, or the Lord is our captain. In other words, it has to do with victory, the banner of victory. He is our, he is our banner of victory. A Jehovah Tesitkenu. It means the Lord, our righteousness. That's six of them. Now, the last one. Now, although it's the last one, it's the first one he gave us. In Exodus 15, uh, 26, uh, the Lord said, If you'll keep all my commandments, I'll put none of these diseases that I put on the Egyptians. For I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our physician, or the Lord that healeth thee. So, God gives us, and, and, and I, I always, I say the best for that. Well, that's not the best for that. So whatever you need him at, at that point is the best. But because we're talking about healing tonight, I saved it for last. God first revealed himself as Jehovah, or Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, or the unpronounceable word, however you want to look at it, but that's Yahweh, Jehovah. And the very, remember now, Schofield said it pointed to an increasing self-revelation of him. He wanted to, upon occasion, reveal who he is, and he did it by making it part of his redemptive covenant name. Okay? So that it was a revelation of who he is. Now, people going around saying, the Lord's making, the Lord putting something on, the Lord made you, you never know, you never know why God's going to, he just, he's the one that makes it, and if you, them people that pray for people to get well, they're of the devil. And people preach that. They're of the devil. Well, did you know the Bible says that he is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your physician, the Lord, the healer, thee, and it's part of his covenant relationship with you. It is part of his redemptive name. He is, in his self-revelation, the Lord that heals us. Well, that's talking about the spiritual disease of sin. No, Jehovah to Sidkenu took care of that, the Lord our righteousness. Amen. 
Hebrews tells us in eight, Hebrews 8, 6, we've, he's obtained a more excellent ministry and he's the mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, people get so crazy. Are we to believe that we have a covenant? The new covenant is a better covenant on better promises and healing's not included in it. Now, the Lord said, I'm the Lord, I change not. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 13, 8, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How often? Yesterday, today, and forever. Well, think about that now. If yesterday, today, and forever means, means what? Yesterday, today, and forever. So if he was the healer yesterday, guess what he is today? And he'll always be the healer. God doesn't change who he is. See, that's the thing. He is the Lord that heals. Not he was the Lord that healed. Well, that's the old covenant. But we got a better one with better promises. Now look, if you went out and got a new car tomorrow and came in here going boom, 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 and I look down and say, you got square wheels. That's not a better car. Doesn't ride as good. I mean, matter of fact, your, your, your jaws are jostled all over the place. You had a drink out and poured Coke all over your head. You know? Well, you know, it's a, better, it's a new car, but it's not a better car. It's not on better technology. Now, now if you came here floating like Star Wars in one of those little transports or whatever, you know, and there's nothing, there's nothing and you just don't want any bumpy roads, you just, woo, that'd be better. That's a better car on better technology, amen? We got a better covenant on better promises. Amen. Meaning this, that the, the, the good of the old came over and then was added, what was added to our covenant? See, under the old covenant, they got covered, they got the promissory note, under the new, we get born again. So we get all the good stuff, and more, not less. I said not less. Hallelujah. All right. Now, let's look at um, some of the types. Or one, of the, one of the major types in the Old Testament, the brazen serpent. Numbers 21, I remember this. Now, the brazen serpent, y'all know, all know about that. You always see ambulances go by. They got the snake on the staff. That was a reference to the brazen serpent. Remember, Israel sinned, brazen serpents came out to bite them. God told them, I mean, serpents came, fire serpents came out and bite them. They started dying. They cried, they cried. Moses went to God, and, and the Lord says, well, do this. Make a serpent, put it on a pole, whoever looks on him will live. And so in Numbers 21, 9, Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, he would be, uh, and he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. It's an allegory. Why? Jesus says in John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus became the snake on the pole to take our sin and our sickness. Let me ask, if the type could heal, certainly the antitype could heal. And what's that, you know, it's just like a thesis and an antithesis. The opposite, the opposite. You know, the type was a type of Jesus. Jesus was the real Okay, I had, I had it with a stool. I tried. Hallelujah. Jesus is, the, now I just messed up the, script, the thing, didn't I? Ben, can you, can you re readjust that camera so your mom don't have to run out? She's, home, she's about to run out here. Hallelujah. If, if a type can heal, obviously that which the type is, is of would heal. It's called antitype, the, the antitype. Jesus was the antitype. He was the real. He was the actual. He was what the type was a type of. And the type would heal. Well, what happens if we look at Jesus? We get healed too. Amen? Is that the best y'all can do? How about a glory be to God? Okay. Isaiah 53 offers probably one of the best commentaries on, on this subject in the Bible. And it, obviously in conjunction with 1 Peter 2, 24, Matthew 8, 17. But it says here in uh, Isaiah 53, verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, now pains, and acquainted with grief, that is sickness. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, he was uh, and we esteemed him not. He was despised, we esteemed him not. 
Uh, surely he hath borne our griefs, sicknesses, carried our sorrows, pains, and we just deemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, we are like a sheep gone astray, have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, sicknesses. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord hath prospered in his hand. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, he make his divide his spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and he was made the interest, he made intercession for the transgressors. Now the Greek word koile, C H O L I Y, means sickness. Makab. M-A-K apostrophe O-B, sometimes Macab also um, means pain or sorrow. So uh, here in Matthew, I mean Isaiah 53, these words are used. And so where it says griefs, it's really sicknesses, okay? Uh, it's true that he had borne our sicknesses. He carried our sorrows or he carried our pains, okay? Matthew 8, 17, well, let's read 1 Peter 2, 24. We read there, by his stripes we were healed, we are healed. First Peter 2, 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. Were. Now Isaiah says we are. What? That's prophecy of a coming event. What's Peter doing? Peter is quoting that prophecy as an accomplished event. Okay, so the tense of the verb goes from in prophecy, we are healed, speaking of a, he was speaking of a coming event. He's looking into the future and talking about God's suffering servant to come. And in that, he says, and by his stripes, we are healed. Peter comes now and begins to quote from that, says, by his stripes, we were healed. He quotes the prophecy, but as an accomplished fact. Okay, who his own self bore, bore not is going to bear, he's bore our sins. In his own body on the tree. That we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness. By whose stripes we were healed. Isaiah prophesied that it was coming. Peter confirms that it has taken place. So this is an accomplished. Or this is a settled. I don't know if you want to you know, use a, a court things. Settled, settled uh, court cases. Or settled law. Established you know, precedent. It's settled. Now. God knowing bozos would show up eventually in the earth. People come along, they read, ah, oh, that's talking about spiritual. Now, people always want to go spiritual sin. You know, the spiritual sickness of sin. Well, no, he bore your sin in his own body on the tree that we be in the dead, the sin should live under righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. See, that, that, that healing thing you're talking about, that's talking about spiritual sin. Really? Let's look over at Matthew 8. Because God decided to take the bozo out of the equation. Matthew 8, 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Didn't say he forgave them. He said he healed them. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So Isaiah's reference to Jesus being the sickness bearer was in reference to physical ailments. Right there. So we have these three passages of Scripture that make it very clear that the bearing away of our sickness by Jesus we had to do with the reference to physical sicknesses and diseases. Since we, we've looked at this, now healing, healing is God's will for us. Say healing is God's will. For me. See, we, now, in most churches, particularly evangelical churches, even they don't believe in healing, don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but I can tell you if they're evangelical, they believe that Jesus is your sin bearer. Amen. And they're right. 100% right. Jesus was the sin bearer. Jesus died for our justification. Glory to God. Amen. He, he, was, he, he died to, to redeem us from the sin, was raised for our justification, seated at the right hand of the Father where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus was the sin bearer. You can get the most anti-Pentecostal, anti-hand laying on Christian in the evangelical world and they believe that. And I agree with them 100%. He is this, he's the sin bearer. Glory to God. 
How do, are you here? What a lot of people refuse to accept is that healing is also part of that redemptive plan of God. Well, Psalm 103 makes it, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Glory to God. Are you here? If they were the same thing, why double state it? If they're the same thing, why is it double stated in Isaiah 53? If they're the same thing, why is it double stated in 1 Peter 2.24? It's because they're not the same thing. They're, they're separate parts of, of man. Now, same sacrifice, same time, different applications to, to the part of, of man's existence. Man being a triune being, spirit, soul, and body. Forgiveness of sin or the redemptive part of sin from sin dealt with man's spirit. Physical heal, sickness, healing of sickness is dealt with his body. Amen. Okay. So about anybody agree that forgiveness of sin is, is a redemptive truth. Uh, it is part of redemption, but it's not the whole thing. Physical uh, ailments and diseases need to be healed, and that's part of the redemptive plan of God. Um, so we, we, need, we can now determine that the benefits of God are in association with redemption. For one only has to glance at the scripture I just quoted in Psalm 103, that he forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Um, and it was written to people who kept his covenant. The redeemed. Now the ministry of Jesus. Jesus made his ministry clear. Clear that his ministry was not his own but the Father's. Now think about that. Jesus said I came not to do my will. But the will of him that sent me. So that means this. When we look at Jesus. We look at the ministry of Jesus. We analyze the ministry of Jesus. What we see Jesus do is the God the Father's will. As a matter of fact, he even said, I only do those things which I see my father do. Amen. Now, we got a lot of people running around here saying, God you know, put cancer on you to teach you a lesson. God did this, killed your baby to teach you a lesson. We just never know what the Lord's going to do. You know, the things of God. You know, his, why he did it, we just don't understand. Well, the problem with that is it doesn't line up with the ministry of Jesus. And since the ministry of Jesus is an expression. Remember Hebrews said he was the, he, he was the expression or the outshining of his glory. Jesus was a replica, replication of the, of, the, of the Father. His ministry represented the will of the Father in the earth. So, I haven't found the scripture where he put cancer on somebody. I haven't found the scripture where he walked by a mama whose baby was laying there and made, made a, a donkey cart roll over it and kill it. And he looked at him and said, I've got a reason. You just don't understand it. I, don't, I haven't found those scriptures. Well, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't even talk to the uh, Syrophoenician woman whose water, daughter was only grievously vexed of a devil. And she still got it for her daughter. He said, it's not right to take the children's baby, the covenant people, uh, the, the parts of the covenant, and get the people outside the covenant. That's what all that meant. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs get the bread, the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He said, your faith got it before you go ahead. Amen. I mean, she's outside, don't even have a right to it. And she's willing to take a crumb like a dog. He said, all right, you got it by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Great is your faith. Hey, amen. Now, we'll talk, we'll preach sermons like crazy on the, the prodigal son, how Jesus taught the, about the prodigal son, how the forgiving power of the father was there. We'll teach all kinds of things where Jesus forgave the woman who was caught in adultery in the very act in the church. Amen. We'll teach things and, and preach things about the forgiveness of God, how God's so merciful. <clears throat> but all of a sudden, and not one time, when I, hear when I hear people teaching on things like the prodigal son, all right, um, Mary coming washing his feet with, the, with, her, with her tears and wiping on her hair. When I hear, when we talk about the forgiveness of God, I don't hear one sermon about that being done to demonstrate his deity. Have y'all ever heard a sermon preached like that? That Jesus forgave her for washing his feet with her tears and wiping with her hair. And that proved he was divine. 
But as soon as we step over to miracles or healings, they're all done to prove he was divine. We separate it from the redemptive plan. And in doing so, we eliminate people's ability to associate the, 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 the healings and so forth as part of God's plan of redemption, just like we would with forgiveness. So the church has been taught that forgiveness is part of the redemptive plan of God, but not, but not, forgive, not healing. When in fact, he healed because that's what he saw the Father do. And it was part of God's redeeming man. Can you say glory be to God? Um, remember the leper? Matthew 8, 2. Behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou can't, if thou wilt, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. That's King Jimmy for, hey, Lord, I know you can, but will you? I, I know you can. You're, if, you're, if you're God, you can do anything. But will you? And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I am the Son of God, and I will do this to prove to you that I'm divine. It's not what he said. He said, I will be thou clean. In other words, he had, see, the guy came, he knew he could. He didn't know if he would. And isn't that what a church is today? We know the Lord can. I said, we know the Lord can. They're not convinced he will. And the first thing Jesus dealt with with the leper wasn't he touched him. Amen. And then said, you know, uh, whatever, you know. I said, oh, no, he didn't touch her and say, be thou clean. He touched her and said, I will. He had to establish a place of faith for the man before he received. So the first thing he says, I know you can, but will you? I will. Be clean. Remember, Jesus didn't do anything on his own. I came to do the will of the Father. When he healed that leper and said, I will, he established the will of God. That healing was the will of God. Okay? Um, I've heard things, you know, in the church. We, uh, we know the Lord can and has wondrously healed, but we don't believe it's his will to heal everybody. Um. Now, to me, that's just a, a sadistic trick to play with one's own children. To bless one with good health and healing while afflicting others with cruel and evil diseases would be insane. There's a psychological term for this kind of behavior, schizophrenia. You're nuts. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. When asked if it was his will to heal, he responded without hesitation, it was his will to heal. So much so that it was the earmark of his ministry because he preached, taught, and healed. Matthew 4.23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of disease, sickness and all manner of disease among the people. In Matthew 9.25, and Jesus went about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus healed because it is, it is, it was and is his nature. Why? Because he and his father are one. The Lord thy physician, the Lord Jehovah Roth, the Lord thy Jesus, the Lord your healer. The word even further supports, further supports this fact by declaring what the anointing for ministry calls him to do, Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Now, isn't it amazing? That preachers now say that sickness is an oppression of God and that trying to lay hands on and get him healed is of the devil. I've heard it. When the Bible says that the laying on the hands to heal him was of God and, that they, and he was healing those who were oppressed of the devil. So he, the word calls sickness an oppression of the devil. Hello. Glory be to God. Jesus was anointed to carry out the will of the Father, and that included healing. Many would say that healing's passed away, yet when we look at the Word of God, Jesus didn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. 
Because God is the same. He is inherently Jehovah Rapha. He will always be. He will not change his nature to appease a bunch of religious zealots who want to keep people away from his redemptive truth to protect their pitiful doctrines. Now, it's one thing. Now, I'll be honest with you. If you don't know what you're talking about, shut up. I heard John Osteen, I remember John Osteen one time he was preaching. He said, yeah, I was in my church, and I was going to deal with the gifts of the Spirit. He said, I started going down through there. He said, you know, the word of wisdom was, you know, our, um, you know, our, our um, philosophers. Word of knowledge was our educational facilities. He said, you know, um, um, he said, preach, you know, prophecy was inspired preaching. And he went on and said, he said, the gifts of healings is our doctors. And, um, you know, and... Um, he kind of, sat, kind of got down to discerning of spirits and, and uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. And he just finally said, people, forget everything I just said. I don't know what I'm talking about. Go home and come back next week. I'll see you. And walked off the platform. I heard him tell that story myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, he just got in there and realized he didn't know what he was talking about. He was trying to explain away everything there was. You can't explain away the supernatural. They went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord, the Lord working with them, amen, confirming the word with signs following. When you preach the word on healing, people can get it. God is the same. God is the healer. The Father sent Jesus to show forth his will in the earth. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.